This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. Okie dokie, folks. Welcome back. Horticulture's fell to rushing, and we're going to be talking about gardening. Java, I ain't got any lights in here. That, is that normal? Um, hey, no, there's something around there. I turn it around. Yeah, I'm say wiggle, wiggle the mouse, um, tap on the keyboard, some stuff to light mouse up. Mouse in here? <laughs> mouse. Well, you you actually don't need any um any any bells and whistles this okay. morning. Okay. I, I, <laughs> don't I'll touch it. I get you straight. I'll get you, you say straight. don't touch anything, fella. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I've I've already trashed this place out. I mean, I came in with stuff to talk about and uh, got a T-shirt. Somebody, uh, uh, Tully Hall, made me a T-shirt. With your with, with one of your many slogans. <laughs> yeah, it's, it says, Mo higher, mo better. I like mo it. Mo better, mo higher, mo better. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? <clears throat> it is a joke. I keep telling people all the time just mow your grass high. Just mow it high. But uh, on this Mississippi Gardening Facebook thing, where I've been uh, chiming in from time to time, more and more people said we did what Felder said, and it works. You got a nice, thick, lush, pretty, relatively weed free lawn just by raising the mower. It's not rocket science. This time of year, I'm getting so many questions about should I put down pre-emerge? Is it too late to fertilize? And what do we do about stickers? Just mow high. (laughs) Set your mower up. Don't worry about it. There are some things you should do if you want to have a good quality lawn. Because you got to keep in mind, a lawn is sort of like a cat. A cat will take care of itself, but if you give it some attention, it'll do better. You know, a cat will eat wild birds and lizards and stuff. But if you give it, you know, a little protein and some water, a nice place to stay, it'll purr. Speaking of, of lawns, talk to me a little bit about army worms. Somebody um, here in the building was talking about they had army worms in their lawn. Yeah. And- it was kind of devastating. Certain they got some patches, and you know, I was like, "Army worms? What is that?" Yeah, <laughs> well, they call that because it's like an army full of them. Yes. What, what, and and a, a, a similar thing. There's a, a, a moth that lays eggs in trees that makes these big webs, these big tent-looking webby things up in trees. One moth can lay what dozens of eggs, maybe two hundred eggs, and each one of those hatches into caterpillar. And they're little eating machines. They're like teenagers. You know, and and they eat the leaves off of trees. They eat uh, leaves off azaleas. They eat your grass just to nubs. They're like little deer, and it's scary looking. But here's the deal: first of all, there's nothing you can do about it. You know, and that's what I was thinking too. It's really just a a little, you know, it's nature. (laughs) Yeah, a moth comes in from where five miles away. You know, you can't keep it from from laying eggs. And by the time you notice the damage. They've done most of their stuff because you don't see them when they're little. So most of the time when people see it, it's freaky looking. It's got all these big caterpillars out there. The grass is brown. It's half gone. And, and it's just. Re- but by that time, the damage is done. And birds and spiders and wasps and all sorts of things love to eat those little things. Anyway, bottom line is if you'll <laughs> mow high, <laughs> give your grass a little fertilizer. If it comes along with rain, the grass greens back up. They don't kill the lawn. They just booger it up for a little while. It comes right back. So anyway, bottom line is almost always what people do to treat it is as bad or worse than what the critters would do. Now, I'll give you an example. All these <clears throat> these caterpillars that make these big webs up in trees. I mean, it'll be just a web is, you know, <clears throat> a foot, two feet long, big, big, thick, full of caterpillar, eating all the leaves. So people will set a, a put a, a paper bag on a stick and set fire to it. And they'll they'll burn <laughs> these these wet, which is nice. I mean, it it goes up quick. For, forget what a horrible thing it is to to do to the caterpillars. You know, I'm, I'm not gonna go that far. Or they 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 cut them off. They cut the branches off. I'm thinking that does a lot more damage. Caterpillars eat a few leaves. You're cutting the limb off. That's called throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So anyway, most of the time, if you'll just ignore it, just ignore it. I know it bothers you, but it's a cosmetic thing, and there's not anything practical you can do that 
here's the kicker that needs to be done. I think sometimes people think if I just let it go, it could get too bad or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of times it can't. You know, having the stuff cut off the end of my nose. You know, <laughs> you got to take care of some things early. But uh, with the caterpillars. Most of the time, by the time you see it, the damage is done. And really, it doesn't do much good except vindictiveness to kill them. There's lots of stuff to eat. I'm not saying don't. I'm not saying there's nothing you can do. I'm just saying it's not that big a deal from the plant's point of view. So if you can relax a little bit, breathe in and breathe out, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. Me and Java Chapman and and uh, Sir Charles back here from Hattiesburg, and he's our intern, and uh, we want, want to talk with you about what's going on in your garden. There's a few things coming up. Uh, let me let me let me call up my little. I made some notes about things that are going on. I'm actually going to be giving a talk um, a week from tomorrow, my first lecture of the fall. So next Saturday, where are you going to be? Next Saturday, I'm going to be in Petal, Mississippi. Okay. H- Hattiesburg, if you're not sure, Hattiesburg is a suburb of Petal. <laughs> Excuse me. My allergies, yeah, man. You're going to have to clear that up before I know. next Saturday. I know. No, it's just, it's just you know, when you walk, you know, get all this, this gunk and stuff, the ragweed. Uh, you know, there's there's several things coming on, uh, and we'll talk about it in more detail next week. But a week from tomorrow, I'm going to be giving a talk in Petal. Um, I can't, I'm just going to put my glasses on job. I'm a mess this morning. I'm a mess this morning. September 24th, Petal Food Gardening. This is going to be behind the sports complex in Petal. I'm going to have my truck down there, and I'm going to be talking from the back of my truck about growing food and herbs in small spaces and containers. And it's a it's a, a it's a in support of a of a local food gardening there. So that'll be a lot of fun. There's also going to be. Um, some things going on. Uh, there's one thing going on tomorrow, Saturday, September 17th, down at Crosby Arboretum, which is just outside Picayune. Uh, they're having a a um, mushroom field walk where you walk around in the in the woods, and they got a mycologist who know understands fungi. He's going to talk about different fungi, edible ones, wild ones, some pretty ones, how they grow, learn to identify, and that sort of thing. That's going to be at Crosby Arboretum, and. Um, you need to call ahead, though, to reserve a space. Make sure they don't have too big a crowd. But if you want details about that, go to Crosby Arboretum. Just Google Crosby Arboretum, and it'll take you to the website. It's got information about that. Uh, and then the the next week, they're having a, uh, uh, a another event. But anyway, Mushroom Walk this Saturday, Crosby Arboretum. Next Saturday, <clears throat> the 24th, I'm going to be doing a thing from the back of my pickup truck in Petal, Mississippi, just outside Hattiesburg. On the 27th, I'm going up to Louisville, the extension office, Jim McAdory. He's, he's one of those hero county extension people. I mean, he does it all. He knows his stuff. He's cheerful. He's friendly. He's helpful. And uh, he's having me up at his talk uh, at, at his office in Louisville, Winston County to give a talk in the evening, 6 o'clock in the evening on September the 27th. And uh, last thing I want to mention, uh, last email, uh, 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 event, uh, next, a week from tomorrow is Wells Fest. I don't know. Have you ever been to Wells Fest, John? Yeah, that's, um, it's usually, uh, what's it? It's right by the baseball stadium off on Lakeland Drive. Is that LaFleur Park? No, uh, I don't know what the name of it is. Yeah, I'm going to look that up, but I, yeah, I know exactly where right, it is. It's right on Lakeland Drive, mm-hmm. just immediately past the, uh, the, the Agriculture Museum. Uh, it's Mississippi's longest-running uh, music festival. It's a fundraiser. I think they're supporting uh, the Good Samaritan this year. Anyway, my friend Lloyd Moncrief, he's a cool guy. He's a horticulturist. He's been growing stuff a long time, the master gardener, but he grows plants all year from cuttings and seeds and divisions, uh, heirloom plants, uh, precious, rare plant, hard to find indoors and out. And he always has a, a big plant sale of plants that you cannot buy at garden centers. So anyway, that's always a big thing for me to see what Loy has come up with over the past year. But again, that's going to be on September 24th. And anyway. that's uh, Jamie Fowler Ball Park. Yeah. Yeah, right down Lakeland Drive. Yeah. Right, you know, and if you're not sure, Lakeland Drive hits Interstate 55. There's an ag museum, there's a baseball stadium, and there's a Wells Fest. Anyway, it's a lot of fun. Got good music and good food and all that. So, anyway, uh, let's slide it down to Wiggins. We're here to talk to folks about gardening, and Sally has given us a call. Good morning, Sally. Hey, good morning. Oh. I want to find out how to uh, dig up and move some naked ladies. 
Oh, uh, you talking about the ribbons or the pink ones that bloomed a month or so ago? Uh, yeah, mine are just now dying. Okay, the, but they're the red ones? No, the pink. They're okay. Pink. Pink okay. Is, pink is reddish, I guess. Yeah. Well, here's here's the deal. The, you know, they they that flower board bud was formed back in the spring, so y- you know it, you don't have to worry about that. The bulb down there is going to start growing roots within weeks. If it's not already starting to grow roots over the next two or three or four weeks, can start growing roots, and then the leaves come up later in the fall and grow through the winter make their flower bud, and then die down. So this is an ideal time because, first of all, they haven't really started growing. Second of all, you know where they are. You know, if you wait another two weeks, you can't find them. So this is probably the ideal time. Second best time is in the spring when the leaves start to die down, but we don't even think about them then. So this is the ideal time. Okay, thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Okay, appreciate it. Uh, she said, naked ladies. Can we say can we say that on, on radio? Especially when we're talking about the the flowers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're called that because it, the flowers come up with no leaves. And they're also called surprise lilies, magic lilies, um, resurrection lilies, all sorts of folk names. But Lycoris radiata is a lot of people just call them spider lilies or hurricane lilies because they bloom in the fall when we get hurricanes. Anyway, uh, now let's go uh, to Adamsville, Tennessee. Bruce, where's Adamsville? Um, about an hour out of Jackson. Okay. Or my my Jackson. Yeah, yeah, you're Jackson. The, the Carol yeah. Reese. You know Carol Reese up there? No. She's a, uh, she just retired. She was extension horticulturist up there at the research station there in Jackson. What a fine, fine okay. research station. But anyway, what you got going on? Okay, I got a question. I got my point set is my Christmas cactus. Christmas, yeah. Christmas cactus first. When should I put it away so it blooms on Christmas or around that time? Mine have always bloomed in uh, um, Thanksgiving. Yeah. Well, here's the deal. Both of those plants, are uh, their flower buds are stimulated by day length. You know, when the days start getting shorter, okay. they start making flower buds. And so okay. if you want to extend it, what you need to do is extend the daylight. You know, give it a little extra light for another three or four weeks. You know, as the days get shorter... They start making flower buds, uh, and you want gotcha. you don't you want that with poinsettias, but with the Christmas, if you want to delay it, you just give them extra light, you know, for, gotcha. four, for fourteen or fifteen right. hours. Yeah, but now I uh, you held them in the dark. <laughs> no, no, no. And and as far as poinsettias, you want it to 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 bloom by Christmas, not on Christmas. Right, and, right. And and the way you do that, you got to keep in mind. Darkness doesn't make the stuff turn red. Uh, the plants have got to grow during the daylight. They've got to get energy. They have to have water and sun, you know, and light and fertilizer and all like that. What makes a flower bud is when the days get shorter. So what you can do for the poinsettia is make you a box that's big enough to set over it. And every afternoon, late in the afternoon, set the box over it and then leave it on until the next morning, 13, 14 hours of total darkness. But take it off in the daytime so the plants can grow because it's the new growth that comes out red. What's on there doesn't turn red. Okay. All right. So what, what we're trying to do is stimulate green growth to start coming out of red growth. And one, you, you trigger that with, with, with darkness, but it's got to have daylight to, to grow during the day. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I appreciate it, Father. As always, good talking to okay, you. Okay. Appreciate it. Thanks for your call. Take, yeah. Take care. Okay. And let's go down to Summit, Mississippi. Avery, how are you today? I'm doing fine, Felder. I hope you can help me with this problem. Um, I've got some invasive bamboo that has suddenly reappeared after about 10 years' disappearance. Uh. Um, It's, you know, it's basically the size of fishing cane, uh, fishing pole, but it's getting up larger, and I need to do something to get rid of it. Yeah. Uh, Well, a couple couple of things. First of all, it, it, it can be done. Uh, it's not easy, and some people say it's impossible. No, it can be done. I've done it myself. But what you got to do, is, is, first of all, understand that the stuff, it has these rhizomes, almost like those canes, running along the, the uh, just beneath the soil surface, and the new growth comes off of those, the runners. And so if you could pull them up, that would help a lot, but that's not going to be practical. So what I would recommend, and I've done this numerous times, a lot of different approaches, this is how I do it. If you cut this stuff down over the wintertime, 
just take your time. You don't have to worry about snakes and yellow jackets and stuff. But over the winter time, just cut it down. Uh, the next spring, when it sprouts back out, let it get about knee high or maybe waist high, and then spray that with a weed killer. The weed killers don't work this time of year because they're not sending food down to the leaves. And weed killers don't work well in the wintertime or hot, dry weather. So cut it down, let the new growth get at least knee high, maybe waist high, spray it with a weed killer, and it'll take it down and kill the roots, top will die. Okay, that sounds great. It, right. it, it, it really works. It sounds like a lot of trouble, but it works. Okay, thanks, Felder. Okay, good luck on it. All righty, now let's go to uh, Florence. Roger, good morning. Well, good morning. Thanks again for what you do. Such a great job at it. Hey, it's you either this or get a real job. A treasure. What's you're that? A treasure. You're a treasure. Well, thank okay. you. Sp- speaking of treasure, in four days is International Talk Like a Pirate Day. Or me treasure. Hard. <laughs> That's big. I have a question for you. What? Uh, I've watched these spider lilies and loved them and transplanted them, which is real easy, by the way. You can find a clump this time of year easier than and when they're when all you have is the green right uh, growth, but and you can chop down in there. And don't worry, you're going to kill. You're going to chop up three or four out of each clump, but you're going to get three or four, and you yeah. can go transplant those, and they'll come up. But this year, Felder, these things are twenty five or thirty percent taller than they've ever been before. You know oh. what? And th- this is really strange because I thought there's something wrong with mine in my back garden. I've got some that are thigh high in my backyard, yeah. and they've never been that. But I just thought maybe it was the the, the rain or or the weather or something like that. It it which which it might have to do. It might be when the when the when the stems were elongating, the cells in there might have had so much rain that the cells got a little bit extra extra juicier. It might I might be something so. like that. But I, I noticed think it's remarkable. Now, I, I, on the other hand, I haven't noticed when we have a drought about July and August or something, whether that has the opposite effect. And I've also noticed that different clumps have different uh, heights, yeah. typically. So you got some short ones and some tall ones. But this year, they are all knee-high or higher. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, 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 I didn't even really – I thought about it in my garden. I thought it was just that one clump in my backyard, but all of them in my backyard are taller than normal. And I, I just thought it was – I didn't think twice about it. I just noticed it when, when you brought it up. So it ain't just me. Yeah, well, that's just an observation for uh, – that tickles my fancy. All righty. Pre- appreciate it. All righty. Uh, now let's go down to Mobile. We're going to have to take a break in just a few minutes, but let's go down to Mobile and talk with Mikey. Mikey, how are you doing today? Oh, who doesn't love having their fancy tickled, man? I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, but regarding plants or anything else. Yeah. Sincerely. Um, my, I didn't hear uh, what his opening question was about the plant. The question that I have is regarding plants that are called crocosmia. Some people call it Mount Brescia. Yeah. I have a neighbor who loves having it, and I've been gradually distributing a little bit because she's only got, you know, she's got to do the full-time job thing. And so I want to give it to her in, in terms that she can actually transplant it on her home estate, um, you know, inherited home estate. Is there a better, can I, because I've got so much that I, I want to be as generous as possible, but and I don't want to be wasteful. Yeah. Um, so should I, uh, some of it I know can be cut off and stored as bulbs because I've seen it for sale in places. And the rest of it, um, should I transfer it to her? with the greenery on it or not is my bottom line question. Okay, I'll answer that in sort of a roundabout way. As far as I know, no one has ever been able to kill that plant. I mean, this is the single most commonly grown pass-along plant in England, and it's considered an invasive exotic. I see it in the middle of the wasteland moors, as far as you can see. Uh, but it's hard to get rid of. I've been pulling it for years at the Agriculture Museum at the Herb Garden, where I planted it back in the 1980s. So it doesn't really matter. But to answer your question, it's better to, 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 to do it when it doesn't have leaves on it, to move the little corms. They're, they're, like, they're, they're like little bulbs of corms, I think is what they're called. It's better to just cut the foliage off 
and move just those, maybe some little stubs of the foliage because it's going to put up all its new growth next year. The plant flops over under the best conditions. It's a floppy plant. And, now. You know, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if you if you pull it up and leave the leaves on, it's just going to flop in, in, even more. Uh, and, and by the way, there's there's a... Montbretia is Crocosmia, but all Crocosmia isn't Montbretia. Crocro- ah. Crocosmia uh, is a hu- big, wide range. It's a beautiful, beautiful cut flower with reds and oranges and yellows and, and uh, mixed. Co- it's just a terrific plant. But the old-fashioned orange one is the one they call Montbretia. That's the one I've got, yeah. and, and that's the one she wants, but she's a new gardener, inherited, you know, the family heirloom ha- home, yeah. and trying to start out. So cut the foliage off and give her the bulbs, yep. or and, go and, ahead and, and, and as I pull them up, pass them to her. That's my question. I, I, would, I would pull them up by the leaves and then snip the leaves off and let the, the corn fall in her hand. And just, okay. in other words, just just well, keep then, just no, keep the corn. This is just across the street. This is just across the street. Okay, okay. I, I, I would, her, you know, okay. Like, okay, I would cut them off when I move them. I'd cut them off. That's what okay. I would. That, that's what I would do. And I've done it many times. I, I don't doubt that. Yeah. So <laughs> in, anyway, that's what I would do. I, I you know, re, do, cut, cut them off and just move the the corns. So thank and you, thank you, thank you again, sir. Oh, for all right. Who you are <laughs> appreciate it. And uh, I should have told Mikey that her neighbor needs to understand that the more somebody wants to give you something, the more you need to think twice about it. That plant is a, uh, it's a favorite of mine. Crocosmia, the one called Montbretia, the old common orange one, they're a beautiful plant, great summer, but they are really, really invasive, I'm just saying, and you can't get rid of them. So anyway, I'm horticulturist Phil Rushy, and uh, I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but it's starting to smell kind of funky in here. That's Java. I'll talk about that in a second. But meanwhile, we're here to talk to Lavanda. Howie, how are no, you? No, t- no, there's no N in it. It's just Lavada. Lavada. All right, oh, Lavada. My apologies. <laughs> yep. What's going on? Well, I have a crocus. I don't know if I pronounced it right. Crocus or crocus plant. And I've noticed that some white stuff has been starting to formulate around the stems. I don't know if it's like a spider stuff or if it's some type of fungus that's growing on the stems. Well, you know, there's several things that can do that. Uh, a, a fungus can be a white, wavy-looking stuff. Uh, you know, a lot of times we have several major fungi out there like that. But there's also uh, a couple of insects that do that. One is a, a mealybug, but there's also one that's a type of, we call them plant hoppers. You know, if and, and they, they stay on the stem. They suck a little sap out, not that big a deal. And if you touch them, they hop. But what they do is they, they cover the stem themselves and the stems of this white stuff up and down the stem as a camouflage. So take a pencil or your finger or something like that and rub it up, and if something hops out of it, it's just a plant hopper. It's not that big a deal. Kind of interesting, as a matter of fact. But if it won't rub off, if nothing jumps out of it, um, I'm going to have to make an educated guess. A fungus will usually, by the time you see that white wavy stuff, it's already half killed the plant. And if it ha- if the plant looks okay and it's just stuff that's on the stem, it rubs off fairly easily. It's just a, a it's camouflage from an insect. Okay. Now that's just that's it's nothing but an educated guess. It might not help you at all. Okay. All right. So basically, if it's not the bug, the plant is on its way out. Well, you know, again, I have to have to put on my thinking cap, plant pathology. You know, you can have a white wavy fungus that's growing on stuff that's not really killing it. So, you know, h- how does a plant look from five feet away? Look okay from but a... It looks good. It looks really good. I okay. Mean, I just saw it come on there. It's so far looking good. See, it, see if it doesn't rub off. It rubs off fairly easily. It's a temper. It's going to be, you know, probably the webbing, the camouflaging from an insect, and I, I really wouldn't worry about it. If you want to do anything at all, get you a little alcohol, rubbing alcohol and some water and just just wet it down with that okay thank you it's just an, just a guess you understand that right uh, what the <laughs> alcohol ratio should be <laughs> oh I, it's not a, I mean you can throw a glass of gin on it if you want to <laughs> <laughs> okay I got you, I got you. okay thank you so much. okay appreciate it okay all right okay bye-bye yeah or, or or just rubbing alcohol if you got it <laughs> anyway now let's go to uh I think to Jeremy and Mobile. Jeremy, good morning. Good morning, Felder. How are you doing, sir? So far, so good. Got stumped a couple of times, but I'm all right with that. Well, rock and roll, man. So I was, I was telling the call screener, um, 
so I'm originally from northeast Georgia. I worked in a nursery for seven years or so. And one of our big things that we would do for shade ground cover was uh, Helleborus and Hucra. Yep. And I've been driving around uh, for the, the four or five months I've lived down here and looking in people's yards, especially in the nice parts of town. Yeah. And I'm, I've not seen a stitch of that stuff. Will it not take down here? Or what's the it, deal? It, it'll do all right. You know, Hucra is, is native. I mean, it grows in, in the woods in the southeast. It's a native plant. And they're Hucra yeah. societies. You know, they've got, a, you know, just, just as far as you can see, go to every British flower show, they got a Hucra thing. And the hellebores. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, my partner's got a uh, a thing about hellebore. It grows them from seed. You know, been to hellebore farms. And and there's some really good hellebores at Callaway Gardens and Birmingham uh, 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 bot- Botanic Garden that, that reseed themselves around. But they do better the further north you go. But yeah. there's no the, – the, I must suspect the main reason we don't see them along the Gulf South is because garden centers don't sell them. Because they're, uh, they're slow-growing, um, yeah. and because of that, they're more expensive, and people tend to go for the, you know, just the monkey grass and stuff like that. But, okay, exactly. I mean, as, as, a, as a commercial grower, I mean, the plugs and those were three fifty a pop. So. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so you, know, you understand, you know. Yeah. And, and here's another thing. Both of those plants, when you buy them in a pot, growing in, in, in pot, as you know, wholesale growers grow stuff in in, in and a, a growing media that drains well because they water automatically all the time. If you take those plants home and put them, pull them out of the pot, stick them in the ground, that potting soil decomposes and the roots rot from staying wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry yeah, more than yeah. the soil around it. So, you know, the people who have success with these are typically the ones who are going to loosen up the potting soil and stir it into their dirt, almost bare root them. And most gardeners, if they're, those kind of gardeners, they can do it in their backyard where you can't see it. So the the reason I'm asking is uh, we got this uh, it's, it's a very well established uh, probably 40 year old uh, Japanese maple uh-huh. uh, I think it's a I think it's an Oshio Benai in the front yard mm-hmm. and the the roots are starting to get exposed uh, and I, I want to do something to to cover that up and make it make it pretty and nice and I'm just trying to figure out a good solution uh, uh, and I know that they have like that toe ticklers brand um, that like uh, uh, James greenhouses sells and stuff like that mm-hmm. and i'm just trying to find something that's going to make that look pretty and have some little tea tiny flowers on it or something is, is, is there something well, that around here that can that yeah, here's, it? here's something first of all you know uh, i'm you know i've been to, to japan and the botanic gardens there and any J- japanese garden anywhere in the world roots are celebrated of some kind of plants you can actually make a nice neat edge around the edge where the where the grass stops and the roots start and have them part of it you know put a, a nice little rock there or something but also you might want to look at some of the different types of mondo grass the black mondo grass the dwarf mondo grass regular mondo grass some of those kind of and put them in little repeated groups here and there with a rock or something because you know they're they're out there all the time you know the hellebores uh, they, you know, they do okay. Mine are actually starting to put up new leaves right now, the hellebores, but they look kind of ratty towards the you know, end of the summer. So, th- you know, look at some of the dwarf, the different types of mondo, the black mondo grass, the dwarf mondo, the regular mondo, maybe a few clumps of something like striped liriope or liriope, whatever y'all want to call it in, in North Georgia. But in other words, some, some little clump forming things with a with an accent of like a, a stone Put you some moss around there. Tuck you some moss in around the roots. Let that be part of the scene. Oh, man, um, one last question for you though. So uh, I've I've always really admired the way it looks, but that pink mondo grass down here it'll grow like wildfire, right? I don't know. Don't know the pink. I might have to look that one up. You know, I, I'm I'm it's, not a, I'm not I'm somewhat of an aficionado of the different kinds of what we call monkey grass, but yeah, I have, yeah. haven't seen a pink one. So um, you got me. You yeah. got my juices going. Yeah, I, I know they grow well in Florida. So they, I mean, they, and I've seen them in in very well, well, well lit full sun scenarios yeah, uh, yeah. in there up in up in up in Athens. But uh, you know, I figured that if they grow in Florida, love they, they should grow down here. That'd yeah, be- and I, I tell you one one more thing before we move on. There's a. Um, a, a plant that you can grow in Mobile that's about as far north as grown, but the peacock gingers. 
you know, they won't grow up in North Georgia. Peacock gingers are great little, sort of like a hosta slash hookah slash hellebore substitute for the Gulf Coast in Florida. Peacock ginger, awfully pretty plant, hardy too. Definitely look all that up. Thank you so much, and I hope you all have a wonderful Friday. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. All righty, pieces. All righty. He's, uh, you know, some weird plant, hookah. It starts with H E U. It's sort of like um, what I was doing during the break, trying to get rid of some of this gunk from all the allergies. Uh, let me see. Uh, we need to go to Pike County, Mary. Hi, Mary. Good morning. Hi there. Hello. Um, it's actually Pike County. Hello. Yes. Oh, I see that now. I got you know. They told me not to to turn on these screens, and I'm having to look at this little phone thing with my bifocals. <laughs> I'm partly <laughs> partly on Java, partly on me. So what's what's up? What's up in North Mississippi? Well, North Mississippi up here. Uh, I have a I had a property. I've been living on it for about thirty years, and it's a quite a long driveway, and it makes a loop, and and so um, the 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 old fashioned yellow gravel had just about washed out in places so i had it re- uh, so i i just had um, a young man who's very smart and does a great job his name is lane but he put in this new gravel and now the uh, the the grass is taking it over what do i do oh no well this is this is normal you know gra- you know what we call soil is a substrate for plants, and anything that has little cracks and crevices that hold moisture, seeds are going to get lodged in, and if we have some rainfall, they're going to sprout. So this is going to, unless you have a, a type of, of uh, paving that locks together really, really tight like slag or chip marble or something like that, uh, you're going to always have problems with little grasses and weeds and things like that, it, it always. And there's a lot of different approaches from wetting down to vinegar to you don't need to use a, a harsh weed killer because, you know, these things come up from seed. But you can just come up with some kind of weed killer of your choice and from time to time just go out there and spray it. There's just no other way around that. It's just well, not. Um, I don't. Um, can you recommend something that won't hurt the birds and the and the bees? And the, very, very few weed killers going to hurt the birds and the bees. I mean, even something like Roundup. Roundup is on the same uh, health risk as red meat. Just don't eat it five times a day for years and years and years. But no, the uh, any of the weed killers that that are. Uh, that they sell at garden centers. If you just wet the weeds down with it, it's not going to hurt the birds and stuff. Uh, and and I'm, I'm very sensitive to organic gardening. Uh, Rodale Press published one of my books, and I've written for Organic Gardening Magazine and all. But it, realistically, there's not a problem if you just wet the weeds down with something that they that they recommend for weed and grass killer. Uh, unfortunately, it's just going to be te- it's just going to be temporary though. This is just going to be part of it. Well, my yard man uh, told me that it would die in the in the in the winter. That's right, but but winter is only for about three months in Tate County. The rest of the year, you got stuff to deal with. Anyway, you know, you can also just live with it. You know, green is a color too. It's you know, it doesn't hurt anything to have it out there. It just bothers us. Oh, but it my, the way he he laid the it was so I, 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 you you, you you cannot imagine how familiar I am with this situation I've been dealing with it for <laughs> decades in my own in my own garden I have to deal with this and you know and I I I got a little uh, 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 it's a hoe that's really really sharp and what I do is I don't chop I put it on top of this stuff and I just scuff it along and slice it like shaving and that works too. It's just a pain. But yeah. I got a little garden. I don't have a long curvy driveway. So anyway, <laughs> it, it, this is just this is part of nature. You know, it's uh, nature filling a void. Entropy happens. <laughs> so anyway, you got the <laughs> mess, order to chaos. That's what the second law of thermodynamics. <laughs> weeds are going to happen, just like shaving our face. You got to deal with it all the time, or else just grow a beard like Java. Well, okay, all right. So, what what kind of uh, weed killer? Uh, not not go get it. Almost any of them work. Oh, oh, you can't you can't do that. Well, it's just it, it, it's just like recommended brands of ketchup. Ketchup is ketchup. Almost any kind of weed killer will do. And I can just go out and just and just get it wet. And it yeah, will... yeah. Oh, this... okay. Well, it's not so many now, so that but you know by well another c- year it'd be really hard. Yeah. But well, I'm it's gonna be from here on. This it's just like shaving. Once you hit puberty, you gotta start shaving, and once you put a gravel <laughs> driveway in, you gotta start scraping. So anyway, good luck on it. <laughs>
Girl, I don't, know. <laughs> don't don't give me that. This is this is this is twenty twenty two. Wees don't care about gender. <laughs> Good luck on it. We got a scoot. Okay, bye. Okay. Well, I'm a girl. Well, I'm a guy, and I don't like wees either. But you know, I've got this slag in my yard. Not slag. It's a uh, tip slate, and it's pretty. It lays flat. But wees grow in it, and I have to get out there and pull them and scrape them. Sometimes squirt them. It's just part of it, part of it. Uh, the the plant I was talking about that's making it funky in here, Java, brought some garlic. It's time to plant garlic, almost time to plant garlic. And you take a, a big old bulb of garlic, pull it apart, and take those individual cloves about finger deep in the dirt sometime in September, October. It grows over the wintertime and grows these big bulbs full of cloves next year. But garlic is planted in the fall. Uh, and it's harvested in the spring when the leaves die down. But anyway, that's my heirloom edible plant of the week, garlic. Start looking for it because it sells out quick. But garlic is a great plant for overwinter in beds or in containers. And Java, I think for this week's podcast, we're gonna, I'm going to uh, drape this uh, Mo Higher, Mo Better t-shirt uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna that, that that Tully Hall made for us. I'm gonna drape it over on these MPB microphones. Use that for our picture of the week. Okay, yeah, no, nah, that's that's perfect. We appreciate uh, him for sending that. That, I, but I, next time I'm gonna request a three X. A three X, yeah, <laughs> yeah, or, or, or maybe a a one X for me. You're a big guy. This won't fit you. It's a little bit too big for me. But I'm gonna use it. You're gonna see. Anyway, let's. We got Juanita back from Oxford. Juanita, thank you for calling back. What's going on? Oh, I apologize for dropping the call, Felder. Okay. I um I just wanted to ask this question. I have a fig tree that my sister planted before she died, and it it's about five years old or six years old now, and it was doing fantastic. Mm-hmm. Given figs, green, beautiful. I would say it's about eight feet tall, uh-huh. maybe seven. And it was beautiful. And all of a sudden, this summer, maybe a month ago, it, it just dropped the leaves. The yeah. leaves turned brown. They fell off. And it all happened like in one week. And I'm desperate to save it. Yeah. Uh, and this, it, 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 I've I been growing figs. I, I, we have a fig tree that my great-grandmother planted before my mm-hmm. mother was born. And it still makes figs. But I've had the same thing happen to me. Here's the deal. Figs are native to the Mediterranean. You know, they don't like really, really, really wet. You know, they're they're native to dry area. And if we have an area, a, a time where they stay wet, their roots get damaged. In the middle of the summer, when they have all those big leaves on them, it turns hot and dry. All of a sudden, they don't have roots there because they got damaged back in all the wet years. So this is something that happens. The bigger the figs get, the more they need roots. And if we have a really wet year, that damages the roots. And typically, okay. the problem shows up in the heat of the summer mm-hmm. because all of a sudden they got more leaves than they can take care of during hard times. Okay. What what you can do is, first of all, check the lower trunk. Make sure that you don't see any little little tubes of sawdust coming out. There's a type of insect that bores into the stems. Uh, it's about the size of a pencil lead, if, if you're old enough to remember what a pencil is. Sure, sure. And, and the, the sawdust comes out in a long, skinny tube, almost like a cigarette ash, but it's about shaped like a little tan uh, pencil lead. If you see that, then that's some, some, uh, some trunk damage. That's the problem. And that's fairly common, the bores. If you don't see that, though, sometime this winter, just go in and cut the plant. If, if the leaves drop off, that's actually not a bad sign. When they turn brown and stick on, that's when it's dead. When they shed, that's just temporary stress. Sometime this okay. winter, c- c- go in and you know thin out some, cut some of the tall stuff back, leave some of it unpruned so you'll have figs, but cut some of the taller stuff out, thin out a few of the branches, take some of the workload off the roots. Let's see if that okay. doesn't help. Okay. I will do that. I'll check those both things. Thank you, Felder, very much. Fingers crossed, Juanita. Fingers crossed. Okay. Thanks a lot. You bet. Appreciate it. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. And let's slide over to the Delta. D. caller from Greenwood, Lifflor County. What's up? Hey, Felder. Yeah. I love your show. Thank you. I have a question about a house plant. Mm-hmm. I bought a beautiful fiddle leaf uh, plant. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, like I like I said, it was beautiful when I bought it. It's about dead now, but I, <laughs> I didn't know how to take care of it. But how do you take care of a fiddle leaf? Well, a fiddle leaf fig is 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 in the same family as fig tree. It's in the same family as rubber tree, 
and they yeah. make huge trees in the tropics. I've seen yeah. them where you could park a school bus under them. They're they're <laughs> they're, they're tropical trees. So if you're going to keep it, you got to keep it like bonsai. You've got to keep it pruned so it stays uh, small and compact. And and by the way, uh, every everywhere you cut the stem, you know, and the the stems are not pretty. They're raggedy stems. Uh, and, and when you cut them back, it seems like you're killing it. But when you cut a stem back, it's just like cutting back a privet head. It sprouts right back out. See, so one of the things you can do, uh, does it have more than one trunk, more than one stem? Uh, they have, no, no, not more than one speak stem. But um, the plant, the, the leaves itself, they fall off. Right, they right. fall off. Right, and here, here's a problem. Because the leaves are big, uh, uh, and old, older leaves fall off anyway. As the plant gets older, the old leaves shed, just like on a magnolia tree. But right. but on this kind of plant, they're so big, it looks like the tree, the plant's dying. If you might just losing some, some leaves. Here's what the plant needs. It needs bright light. It doesn't need necessarily full sun, but it doesn't want to be in a dark corner. So put it close to a window. It needs to be watered when it gets dry. Don't let it stay dry, but don't keep it wet. And needs a little fertilizer from time to time, just a little bit. So that's what the plant needs to grow, to put on new leaves. If yours is tall and leggy and all the leaves at the top, just, I hate to say trust me on this because I used to work for the government. But trust me, you can, you can cut this plant back to a, a broomstick three feet long and it will sprout back out. It will sprout back out. Even the dead leaves, because there's plenty of them. No, no, as, as older leaves die, you know, they look bad, and they're big. You know, they're bigger than a huh? dinner plate. So, uh, you know, as older <laughs> leaves die, that's, 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 that happens naturally. The new uh-huh. leaves come on the ends of the branches, but if they're getting okay. too tall and you want some leaves down lower, just cut it back, and it'll put out some strong new growth. It's like, start, it's, it's like cutting a hedge back. It'll come back. Oh, okay. I never knew that. Yep. Okay, Phil. Yeah. I, I, I give a little bit of hope. I've got a rubber tree named Big Jim. Big Jim, <laughs> rubber tree and fiddly fig, same family. I've had Big uh-huh. Jim since 1974, and uh-huh. I have cut that tree back. And we're talking about a, tr- a tree that you could build a tree house in in the jungles. But I've okay. cut this plant back to three, four, two, three, four feet tall dozens of times, and it always puts out new growth. Okay, okay. Sounds good. It ain't going to be right. fun. It's not going to be fun. It's going to be a little scary, but go for it. All right. Sounds good. Sounds okay. good. I'm going to do that. Thank you. I learned a lot today. Okay. Okay. <laughs> if if, if yeah. it doesn't make it, don't call me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good luck. Okay. It, it should work fine. All right. Thank you so much. All right, D. Thank you for your call. <laughs> All righty, folks, we'd like to remind you that a week from tomorrow on the 24th, I'm a, me and my truck are going to be lecturing, talking about growing food and herbs and stuff in containers. We're going to be talking from the back of my pickup truck in Petal, Mississippi. Uh, we'll give the details next week. Uh, meanwhile, let's go down to Mobile and talk with Gene. Good morning, Gene. How are you, sir? Doing good. Got a question about, I got some amarillo that I've had for a number of years, and mm-hmm. I keep them in pots and move them in and out of the greenhouse. Yeah. But I want to plant them in the ground. Yeah, no problem. And, and would this time of year be a good time to plant them? Well, you know, the, 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 the uh, am, am, amarillos, well, uh, they're from South Africa. They can actually be green right through the wintertime on the coast. You know, mm-hmm. they, as a matter of fact, they bloom kind of early, but they, they have no problems on the coast. They actually don't mind being in slightly moist soil because, you know, that's what, but it's no problem at all. If you put them out now, they may. F- wilt a little bit because you know they've they've got the, those leaves are used to the kind of roots they got right. but uh they, you know if you want to cut them back a little bit they'll put out all new growth uh in late winter spring and do just fine okay one other question real quick i had some spider lilies i had dug up several years ago and i had a number three wash tub a couple of them uh-huh so I, I went all around the neighborhood when it was sprouting up. I dug them up and put them in this thing i think it's gonna be a beautiful thing in the spring and whatever a fall rather well, it's been about five years and nothing ever happened. Long story short, uh, I moved the wash tub the other day and the bottom fell out. Well, when the <laughs> bottom fell out, I had, had to plant them. They were hard to begin. And I, I wanted to plant them anyway. Yeah. But but uh, I guess they'll survive. Yeah, they'll, they'll do fine. They're called hurricane lilies. Uh, you know, down on, you're talking about the ribbons, right? 
Your spider lilies, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll do fine. Uh, they're going to start growing roots over the next uh, month or so, and they grow. They look like striped monkey grass over the wintertime, die down. As long as they get sunshine in the winter, they make their flower bud in the late winter and springtime, right before they die down. As long as they get some sunshine in, let's say, late February, March, and April, before they die down, they'll make a flower bud. No, they won't bloom now, then. Probably not. They should have started blooming by now. You you may get a few, but you know. Well, they were putting sprouts out, you know, and that not very very long. When I was surprised, because when the bottom fell out of the bucket, I had to do something with them. Then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I save that bucket. You may want to sink it halfway in the ground in case you want to plant something that'll get away from you. Well, I tell you what, those things did, uh, never did did uh, do anything, and uh, and I, I don't know. I thought they'd be beautiful, and you know. Yeah, you know, three washed up full of fifty blooms, and they'll never had a bloom on them. Well, again, again, they make their flower bud in late March and April, Fe- February, March, and April, towards the end of the winter and springtime, right before the leaves. That's when they make their flower bud. So as long as they get sunshine, they've got it on the north side of your house. They ain't gonna get any sunshine. They can't do it. So no, put them where they get some spring side. sunshine. Yeah, they're on the east, east side of the house. They'll get a, a noonday sun. That yeah. But the, well, how about cutting the grass over the top of them? No problem. But you're going to have to mow around them in the wintertime because, you know, that's, what, that's how they make their livings from their leaves. Yeah, okay. I, I know where they are. All righty. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. We've been rocking and rolling today, Java. Rocking and rolling. It really has been a, a, a jam-packed day. We yep. only took two breaks and a lot of back-to-back-to-back calls. That's right. We'll be here same time, same place every week. Fridays rebroadcast on Saturday. Appreciate again Tully Hall making this Mo Higher, Mo Better t-shirt for us. And um, look forward to getting my, my talks cranked up in Louisville and Pedal and in uh, all different places. I'm going to be this starting uh, a week or so. We're going to start traveling around and taking it to the road. I'm horticulturist Phil Rushing and Java Chapman, such a patient guy. Gosh, he's such a patient guy. I appreciate you so much, man. We're going to be taking uh, a whole week off so I can gather more information and learn some stuff. Going to go out and plant me some lettuce this weekend. Going to plant some garlic this weekend. Too early for pansies. But I'm going to do some gardening while it's nice and cool. And that way I'll be ready for wintertime. If you want to give us a, a, a check out any kind of information, go to my blog, felderrushing.blog. Got a little thing that says email me. Uh, meanwhile, if you get a chance, check out the Mississippi Gardening Facebook page. You don't have to join it or anything to read what other people are up to. We're going to take a break. Horticulture's fellow rushing. Go to a garden center. Take a kid to a farmer's market and show them what we do best, and that's get dirty. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app.